I feel the anointing. Yes, yes. See, some of y'all, what I'm speaking is foreign. Right. But why? when I say that it is foreign to you, that's why you go to church and leave the same way. Yes. You haven't learned how to pull out of the cloud. Yes. So, so God doesn't just move because you're here. He doesn't just move because you're a Christian. There are Christians all over the country that have never even saw God move. There are things you have to learn how to do to create an environment for God to begin to move into. Now, in Acts chapter 2, I want y'all to see this real quick. It says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Someone say, One accord. One accord. So they are on one accord. Now, what this means is that as they were together, one person's not daydreaming. The next person isn't thinking about what they're going to do after church. The next person isn't impressed with the lighting. The other person isn't going, well, the sound system isn't working right. Another person isn't saying, well, you know, I wish there was a live band. Uh, another person isn't saying, well, I wish there was this. Another person isn't saying, well, the program is supposed to be this at this point. Their focus after 10 days was just glory. After being in the place waiting for 10 days, their flesh had died as they were waiting, and the only thing left was glory, and that was it. Now, so 10 days. They're waiting for 10 days. Now, I believe it took them 10 days to reach the point where they were all on one accord. And so as we pray, what starts to happen is our flesh starts to die. Now, I want to show you something. One of the signs that you've entered into the spirit is not, watch this, it's not that you're having a vision. That's, that's one way, yes, amazing. But you're not always going to have a vision when you're in the spirit. The way that you know that you're in the spirit is by your appetite. Someone say, by your appetite. So in other words, your flesh only wants the things of the flesh. So what this means is when you're in church and you're sitting and thinking about food, you're not in the spirit. Oh, I feel this. I feel this. And what's this? You're not in the spirit yet. When you're thinking about what you're going to go do next, you're not in the spirit yet. Because your spirit only wants glory. Your spirit only wants the things of God. Your spirit only wants the move of his spirit. Your spirit only wants the things of God. Your spirit wants to pray. Your spirit wants to worship. Your spirit wants to adore him. Your spirit wants to engage with him. Your spirit is alive. So, so what's happening right now is I'm speaking to a room full of dead people. But by the time you leave, God's going to bring you back to life. That's why it's hard for you to respond. Because I'm speaking to a part of you that hasn't quickened yet. I'm speaking to a part of you that hasn't came alive yet. But Romans 8 and 11 says that the Spirit will quicken our mortal body. So your Spirit, your Spirit only wants the things of God. Now remember this. The Spirit is willing. Someone say, my Spirit is willing. So I want you to keep this in your mind. Your Spirit's willing. Your Spirit's willing. But my flesh is weak. So this verse was not telling us that God's intent was for us to walk in our humanity. That verse isn't saying, well, we're just going to always be some weak Christians. We're just going to always be prayerless people. We're just always going to be a weak people. No, what Jesus was, was revealing, what the scripture was telling us it is, though you have flesh, there's another part of you. There's another part of you that's not weak. There's another part of you that's strong. There's another part of you that's mighty. There's another part of you that's filled with fire. Come on, there's a part of me that when I'm tired, that will come alive when I get in spirit. There's a part of you that will rise to the occasion. Whenever I'm in spiritual warfare, there's another part of me, and it's the real me. It's the inner man. It's the spirit man. It's the part that's one with him. Say there's another part of me. And so Jesus was trying to reveal not that we're weak, not that we are people who will not pray. He was saying that I have awoken a part of you, the part that died with Adam. I have awoken the part of you that's filled with my divine DNA. I have awoken the part of you that's just like me. I've woken the part of you that doesn't want Satan. Think on those things which are above. 
So your spirit will call you into a higher way of living. Your spirit will bring you to a higher way of walking. A higher realm of existence. God will bring you into that place and call you out of the low places. Come on, everyone that's in this room. God is calling you out of the low places. He's calling you out of the carnal place. He's calling you out of your flesh. And he's calling you into the realms of glory as a son. And so, when it says they were in one place, they were in a place where all of their spirits are activated. This is what it means to be on one accord in this text. That all their spirits were active. All their spirits had come alive. Come on, throughout the 10 days, every part of them, every person, all 120, by then their spirits were all active. Come on, what will it look like when a full room full of people that are believers will carry the glory active in the spirit? What will it look like when God activates the body of Christ? I want to tell you what it'll look like. It won't look like dead church. It won't look like a bunch of people that don't know what to do. When the glory shows up, it will look like the wind of God blowing. It will look like fire falling. It will look like the book of Acts. It will look like Pentecost. I came to declare on this Passover. Come on, after as we're passing over, that the body of Christ is passing over into another Pentecost. We're about to experience new fire. Come on, for 2021, there's a glory, there's an anointing that God wants to release on us in 2021. So they were in one place, on one accord. They were all active in the spirit. What that means is there wasn't a single person that was daydreaming as they were praying. There wasn't a single person that was wondering about what they were going to do next. Every single person was alive. Every single person was in a place where they were seeking after the glory. Come on, with the same intensity. Come on, they weren't just spectating and watching people. Spectators never get anything from God. Spectators don't receive what God is releasing. I don't want to miss what he's doing. I'm going to jump into the wind of God and be carried by the wind. Those that are of the spirit will be carried by the wind. They're like the wind. Every time the wind blows, I follow the blowing of his spirit. So they were on one accord. And as they were in this place in the spirit, as they were in this realm of glory together, it says, and suddenly, and suddenly, and suddenly. Now what I love about the supernatural is that when the glory of God comes, it's not something that can be initiated by man. We can't initiate when the glory comes, but we can prepare ourselves for it. And what happened is throughout the 10 days, they were in 10 days of waiting for the glory of God to come. Come on, 10 days of waiting for the glory. Come on, we have a generation that we want church service to be over in an hour. But what if I told you that when God wants to release his glory, come on, there's times it takes more than an hour. Come on, to begin to prepare the ground for the seed of revival. It takes more than an hour. Come on, for God to open up the prison doors. single week every single week witches they're praying from 12 midnight to 5 in the morning every single week they're praying from 12 midnight to 5 in the morning and they're cursing your family they're cursing marriages they're cursing churches come on they're attacking leaders and come on and we got the nerve to want to be in church for one hour come on while the witches have been in church for 12 eight hours they've been fasting and praying against you come on god wants to stir up the believer to begin to go back into the place where they were in the book of Acts. come on you can't ask for revival if you're not a praying people you can't ask for revival and you're not the people that will seek after his face And 
suddenly there came a sound from heaven. So this was an audible sound. This was a sound of the wind of God blowing from the heavenly realm. Come on, and, and when the sound came, it said it was a rushing mighty wind. Come on, we live in Florida, so we're familiar with the storms. We're familiar with the hurricanes. This was something that was amplified far above that, and the wind began to blow. But look what it says it did, and it filled the house. Fire filled the house. Wind filled the house. This means before it became available for you to experience, it had to come into the environment. It had to come into the air. Come on, many of you don't understand why we're trying to create an atmosphere. It's because whatever is not in the atmosphere will never be experienced by the people. When I say lift your voice, it's because I'm trying to get you to get your breakthrough. I'm trying to get you out of poverty. I'm trying to get that demon off your back. Come on, let your voice. We're trying to get a certain level of prayer in the room. Now I want you to understand. The Bible talks about a strength to give birth. A strength to give birth. You can have a little bit in the monitors. A strength to give birth. A strength to give birth. What's this saying? What's the Bible talking about when it's talking about a strength to give birth? But how have I brought you this far and you don't have a strength to, to give birth? But what this means is that there are things that God needs a certain level of intercession to come into your life. In other words, this is what I'm saying. Passive prayer cannot birth prophetic promise. I said passive prayer cannot birth prophetic promise. Somebody said the effectual and the fervent prayer. Come on, that can interpret it prayers with fire on them. That's fire prayer. There's a certain level of intercession, of a sound that bursts things in the spirit. In other words, that's what I'm saying. You can come to church, be in an atmosphere where God desires to do something, but never open the door enough for it to come through. In other words, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you have to pray strong enough and long enough for heaven to dilate. Hope y'all understand what I'm saying. For heaven to dilate. It, see, it's not that, that, that the atmosphere is not pregnant. See, see, you can get pregnant, but God wants a full term. He wants something to be born in the atmosphere. And every time we pray, there's a birthing. I wish people understood. When you worship, there's a birthing. When, you, when you're in intercession, there's a birthing. And you're stopping mid-travail and wondering why you haven't birthed anything out. In your own prayer life, you wonder why don't I see answer prayer? Because you don't know how to travail. This generation, see the old school church, they didn't know Greek and Hebrew. They didn't know all the things we know all the time. They weren't able to exegete text all the time. Come on, y'all know those church mothers? They didn't know how to do all that. But what they had was a travail. They had a travail. The other thing they had, they had a rock. Come on. Y'all remember when that intercession would come on that mother? Come on, and she would jump up in her seat and she would start to release a sound. Come on, and the atmosphere would begin to change. And that woman that did not know Greek, that did not know Hebrew, 
through. She would say, hell, the atmosphere was shit by the sound of our voice. We need some old school back in us. I said, we need to get some old school back in us. Come on, we got used to the fog machines. Come on, we got used to the rip jeans. We have forgotten how to create an atmosphere. We forgot. I remember when I would be around believers. And these believers, we would call them religious. I feel the anointing. But in our attempt to not be religious, we've gotten dry. You are, let me tell you a secret. You are just as religious when you have no fire on your life. Come on, you just dress up to date. You're just trendy. You just got new haircuts and new hairstyles. You just got nice shoes. But what makes us not religious is the deposit of heaven that's on the inside of me. That's what makes you fresh. That's what makes you new. God wants to give us a new wine. But he said, I can't pour new wine in old wine skins. I can't pour what I'm trying to pour into you because you have an outdated mentality. I can't pour what I want to pour into you because you haven't allowed me to upgrade your mentality. I want to upgrade the church. I want to upgrade the ministry. I want to upgrade your business. I want to upgrade your prayer life. But I can't pour my oil and my wine on the people that are outdated in the spirit. New wine and old wine skins. See, see, wine skins deal with mentalities. They deal with mentalities, ways of thinking, ways of thinking, right? Ways of thinking. Wine skins. And the biggest transition there was from one wine skin to another one was from Judaism into the New Covenant. That was the biggest shift from a wine skin. But even in today, there are modern wine skins. Come on, they need to be adjusted. They're a modern wine skin. Come on, some of you, you're still stuck in the wine skin from when you got saved years ago. You're still stuck in the wine skin. Come on, from the 1980 prophetic movement. You're still stuck in the wine skin of the 1990 apostolic movement. Some of you are still stuck in the 1970 word of faith. Some of you are still stuck. Come on, there's a glory move that God is releasing. Come on, this next move is going to be a move of his glory. This next move. It's not just going to be prophetic. This next move is not just going to be apostolic. This next move is going to be a move of the glory of God. So God has to find the people. Someone say the eyes of the Lord. They go to and fro. Seeking, seeking for someone, for someone to, show to show himself strong to you. Whose, whose hearts have been made perfect, made perfect toward him. Yes. You cannot yes. have a move of God Jesus. with an imperfected heart. Yes. This next move, this is what I want y'all to know. This next move is not going to come because of talent. It's not going to come because we have the best band. It's not going to come because of, uh, we, we updated the way, the design of the church. It's not going to come because of my preaching. It's not going to come because of my revelation. It's not going to come. It's going to come when we humble our hearts enough. I said, when we humble our hearts enough, are you broken? Are you really, are you really broken? Are you really broken in his presence? No, I mean, are you really, I want you to think about it for a moment. Are you broken? Does it take a lot to move you? 
Do you have to be motivated by somebody to seek after the faith of God? Do you have to be motivated to give them honor? Come on. Because if, if you need me to hold a mic and lift my voice, what are you doing when you're at home? What are you doing when you're all alone? What are you doing when you're by yourself? Well, I know you're not being a witness. Come on, because you can't even be bold in a room full of believers. So I don't know what you're doing around the unbeliever when you're afraid for believers to see you lift your voice. Break that fear of man. We, we, we belong our brokenness. The Bible says that to those who are not hungry or to those who are hungry, even bitterness tastes sweet. I'm going to prove to you that we are not hungry enough. We're not hungry when it requires a professional singer. When you're listening to worship from an entertainment mentality. Oh, they didn't do enough runs for me. Oh, I wish they ran a little bit. I would have did that no longer. I like that song in the other version because, you know, in the, in the other version, they, 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 the runs are better in that song. Well, they're not singing to you. Come on. Worship is not singing to you. Come on. Worship is not about moving you. It's about moving heaven. God wants to destroy entertainment. One of the biggest hindrances to the move of God is entertainment ministry. One of the things that hinder the real move of his spirit and real authentic Christianity is entertainment Christianity. I want to tell you a secret. If your faith would not change people in the bush, it's not real Christianity. If your faith will not impact people in Afghanistan, it's not real Christianity. Now come on now. If you can't set up that in China in the underground church, you can't set that up in Syria, you can't Set it up there. Make a ministry. Must. Oh, shit. I want to, I want you to, in the bush in Africa, you have people that live in like huts, right? And here it is. Say God takes you and your Christianity to these people in the bush. Would what we do here in America today save them? Because what God did in the upper room saved the Gentile nations. What God did amongst them in Acts chapter 4 saved people in Samaria. So in other words, this is what I'm saying. If you can't take what we do and put it anywhere in the world, it's not authentic. If we can't take what we do and carry it out to the street, it's not authentic. I want y'all to think about this real quick. And I promise I'm about to transition. I want you to think about this with everything in your heart. What are you attracted to? Because what you're attracted to reveals what's in your spirit. I meet people and they say, all oh, these fake ministers. Well, now, I'm going to pose this though. Why do you follow so many of them? You mean you haven't seen a real one yet? You mean you haven't heard the voice of a real one? 
Because I know people all around the world that are raising the dead. I know people all around the world, come on, that are seeing the miraculous, that are changing nations. Come on, all Christians are not fake. That's only the dead church. But there is a remnant of people, come on, that God is stirring up in these end times. And they're going to carry the glory that was seen in the book of Acts. They're going to carry the ancient apostolic oil, that prophetic oil. We're going to carry it to the generation. But I want you to know, what are you attracted to? Are you attracted? This is what the Lord told me. He said, every voice is not heard in heaven. Now, you remember Deuteronomy 32, what does it say? It says, as Moses was preparing to speak, he says these words, hear my voice, heaven. What this means is, as a believer, when I speak, my words are not just for people. That's why it says we will preach the gospel to creation. So in other words, when I speak, I have an audience of heaven as well. This is why, as I speak, sometimes people tremble in their seat with power. As I speak, people start to quicken in their seats. As I speak, people start to feel the atmosphere be filled with power. It's because this is heaven's involvement in my word. Now, this is my point that I'm making to you. So here it is. Hear my voice, O heaven, and hear my voice, O earth. So in other words, what this is telling us, and this is what the Lord was telling me, everyone who claims the name of Jesus is not heard in the heavens. And this is what the Lord told me. He said, only backslidden people follow backslidden voices. Because once you come alive, certain stuff doesn't even move you anymore. You're not even moved by that stuff anymore. They had a thousand people share their posts. So you read it and you go, I don't know why they even share that. It doesn't move me. Because something in you is different. Now you can be seated for a second. You can be seated. You can be seated. What, God, what is God trying to do? He's trying to stir the remnant. He's trying to do a Haggai chapter 1. Where it says that God stirred the spirits of the remnant. He stirred the spirit of the remnant. So in other words, your spirit should be stirred. But, but in particular it says stirred. How do you know that your spirit stirred? This is good. How do you know that your spirit has been stirred? Now let's, so let's go here. Let's go to Haggai. It almost got loud in here. I'm still in like 10% of my mantle. Now look at this. I want you to see this real quick. I'm trying to see where I want to begin us to read. So let's start, let's start at verse number seven. Let's, let's just go ahead and start at verse 1. So we're in um, the book of Haggai, chapter number 1. It says, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, 
the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, The people says, The time has not come. In other words, is not the right time. That the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple lie in ruins. In other words, he's saying, is it time for you to live only for yourself? Is it time for you to only care about your career? Is it time for you to only care about yourself while your city lays in ruins? See, religious people don't care about the condition of the city. They don't care about the murder rate. Come on, they don't care about sex trafficking. They don't care about the laws that are being passed. They don't care about anything else as long as they have a little bit of money in their pockets. Come on, they feel good about where they are. But remnant people, we care about the region that we are in because we have the heart of God. Come on, because we have the heart of God. And when, and when we feel what God feels, and every time there's a murder on the street, it breaks the heart of God. Every time there's an abortion, it breaks the heart of God. Every time something happens in our region that goes against the will of God, every time a law is passed, come on, that will hinder the church and bring people into oppression. It breaks the heart of God. And when we're remnant people, we carry a burden for our city. We carry a burden for our nation. We carry a burden for our region. So we got all these people talking about, I, I'm in the remnant. But we're not even moved by what's happening in our city. We're not moved by what's happening in the nation. You're not a remnant person. You just like to be entertained. You're not a remnant person. You just like to fall out on the floor. Come on, but there's people that I want more than just falling out in the floor. I want more than just an experience. I want to shake my city. I want to change my generation. I want to flip the world upside down. So, so they... While their city was laying in ruins, they had come back out of captivity and they were satisfied with being out of captivity. So in other words, you're saved now and you're happy that you're saved. You're happy that you're no longer in addiction. You're happy, come on, that you're no longer in depression. You're happy that your life is where it is today and you've forgotten about the people that you were assigned to be a deliverer to. Come on, you've forgotten about the people that were just like you, that were stuck in addiction. You've forgotten about the people that were bound by sexual immorality just like you were. You've forgotten about the people that were bound. Come on, and that you have been given to be an answer to. Come on, the Bible says, I have given you and your children, Isaiah, to be a sign and a wonder. You are called to be a sign and a wonder. Some people want to see miracles, but you're a walking miracle. Some people need to see a sign, but you're a walking sign. You are the evidence that Jesus is the deliverer. You are the evidence that Jesus is Savior. You are the evidence. So they were satisfied. They were happy because they were in a better place. They were happy and they invested all their time into building their own house. Come on, into building their own house. Into building their own house. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. So, verse 4. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled house? In this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore... Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. In other words, think about this. Think deeply about what, what I'm saying to you. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he 
who earns wages, earns wages to be put into a bag with holes. In other words, you make money and you cannot figure out where your money's going. Come on, you, 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 when you write out your budget, it makes sense on paper that you should have a lot of money left over. Come on, but there's not enough left over. What is God trying to say? There is no satisfaction walking in your own agenda. Come on, when you walk by your own agenda, there's no peace. When you walk in your own agenda, come on, there's no joy. When you walk in your own agenda, there is only agenda for people that know the agenda of the kingdom of heaven. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. You are not made to live for yourself. You were called to live for something greater. You're not made to live your own way but you were called to lay down your life and begin to walk. Come on in the ways of the kingdom of heaven. Now look at this. Look at this. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts and he says it again. Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple. I love this that it says go up into the mountains. I believe this is prophetic that you cannot build. Come on, without going up the mountain of God. Come on, there's a mountain of fire. Come on, that we have to get our instruction from. There's a mountain of fire. Come on, that we go in order to have an encounter. Come on, you're not a remnant person if you don't go up the mountain of God. You're not a remnant person if you don't know the ways of the mountain of revelation. Come on, God is calling us to go up. Look at this. And bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. But look, says the Lord, you looked for much, but indeed it came to little. You've done all these things. You've looked for relationships. And no matter what you've done, it comes to little. And it's because when you were born, See, there's not a single person in this room that was born by mistake. Come on. Written in the heavens concerning your life is a purpose and a destiny. Come on, you have a destiny. And that destiny that God has recorded in heaven, come on, is much bigger than what you think. You are not just an average ordinary person. You were sent into the earth. I don't care how you were conceived. God allowed you to come. He sent you forth to come. And he has destiny written on your story. Look at this. It's come to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. God says, I am the one that did it. Oh God, I'll be I am the one that did not allow what you've done for yourself to work out. I am the one that stopped that from working out for you. I am the one that stopped you from having that Ishmael. I am the one that separated you from that relationship. I am the one that sifted you and brought you to a different place. It is me who did it. It was not the devil. There's people you've been praying against the devil. But God says no. The reason you were experiencing warfare is because you were outside of my will. But I come today to bring you into the center of my will again. Some of the warfare that you've been experiencing is because you've been like Jonah. And Jonah, I called you to do something and you've gone the wrong way. But today I come to bring you back into alignment with me. Today I come to bring you back into the place that I called you to be. Today I come to cause you to line back up to your story that I've written in heaven. Look at this. He said, I blew it away. I blew it away. But look at this. Look at this. Because of my house. That is in ruins. While every one of you runs to his own house. See? In American Christianity, 
We are taught that God wants the American dream for you. What about the missionaries? Who sell everything they have. Come on, in order to advance the gospel. And I'm not saying God is calling all of us into, into being missionaries. But what I'm saying is, God is calling you for more than going to work, making some money, and going home. Look at this. There is no amount of money that can fulfill purpose. I want to tell you a secret. If you are outside of your purpose, you're, you're like a fish out of water. And no matter how much money you make, see, some of you think you're going to become happy when you make a certain amount of money. Celebrities have already proven to us that that's not true. This is why they, they thought that money would fix their self-esteem. And so what they did is they go and they get plastic surgery. Then after they change this feature, they look and they're still insecure. So what do they do? They change another feature. And then after they change that feature, they look again. There's something else they don't like about their body. So then they get another change. And then before you know it, they don't even look like their self anymore. And they're still unhappy because there's an insecure little girl that's still on the inside. There's an insecure your little boy that's still on the inside. Come on, I want to tell some of you that your insecurities is not because of your weight. Your insecurities is not because of your situation. It's something that's on the inside. You are more than the amount of money you make. You are more than what the world declares you are. You are more than what your parents think of you. You are more, come on, than what the people around you think of you. You are more than that. Come on, you are more than that. Some of your life doesn't look like where your destiny is going to take you yet. But I want to tell you, you do not appear today what you will become. Come on, but you are the house of God. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Come on, you are a man filled with God's spirit. And nothing about you is ordinary. You're supernatural and God is about to come you to realize who you truly are. Look. I need to get through this real quick. So look at this. Look what he says. Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house, therefore, the heavens above you withhold do. What is many ways to open the heavens? Mm -hmm. And there are people that teach that heaven is already open. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to know this. Until you minister, you really will not truly understand open heavens. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Jesus gives a word to Nathaniel. He says, In you there is no guile. Y'all remember that? Yeah. And then Nathaniel is impressed by what he sees. Yeah. But then Jesus tells him, you're impressed by this? You're impressed by this word of knowledge I've given you? He said, you will see the angels of God ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. In other words, what he was telling him was this. Right now, what I just ministered to you was not from under an open heaven. Oh he said that was just a gift of the Spirit. But he was saying, but you're going to see the heavens open over me. And you're going to see a higher apparition of the supernatural than what you just saw. Because there's about to be another open heaven over my life. I'm telling you the heavens can open and the heavens can also close. So in other words, I have places where, where I've gone to minister and I was just in the gifts of the Spirit. And then I have places where I've gone and the heavens open. And when they open, there's a higher realm of the supernatural that becomes available. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say there's a connection. Someone say there's a connection. There's a connection. Between the heavens being open 
and your fruitfulness on the ground. In other words, watch this. The Bible says that there was what's called iron ground. Now, now the reason the Bible was describing this to us is because where the ground is iron, it can't grow anything. But it mentions it in the context of a brass heaven. Oh God, I don't have some time. In other words, a brass heaven is this. It is a heaven that cannot receive. Oh God. So in other words, you pray something and that saying that it goes up and hits the ceiling and comes back. I want you to know that is a real saying in the supernatural. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that when the heavens were open, that he will favor the works of your hands. Yes. In other words, when heaven is open, there's no failure in my life. There's no failure in the things that I do. Come on, is there anybody in the room that you do a lot of things? You try a lot of stuff. And I want you to know it's not because you've done it wrong. It's not always because you don't have a good strategy. It's not always because you're doing the wrong business. Sometimes it's because you have not learned how to move under an open heaven. When heaven's open, the purpose of heaven opening. Now, now someone say the earth was created, the earth was created. to be receptive. To the, to the heavenly realm. So, in other words, when God made the heavens, yeah. he created them in a unique way. Yeah. Let's see God shifting us. We're in a different place now. Yeah. Now, now, look at this. When God made the heavens, the heavens, it, I, I'm going to tell you what happened. Now your spirit's active. Yeah. And there's no hindrance to the flow now. Yeah. now I want to, so, so, God created the heavens, and he created them in a unique way. We know there's three heavens. In the beginning, God created the heavens. So it is, there's three heavens. It's really one heaven, but different dimensions of that same heaven. Okay? Now, in scripture it says that there's heavens above heaven, but then it says there's heavens of the heavens. Those are two different things. One is speaking vertically, the other is horizontally. Is speaking of within each realm of heaven, there are different places inside of it. Yeah. Now listen. So there's something important. So when God made the heavens, he made what's called a firmament. Yeah. Y'all familiar with that term? Yeah. Yeah. That word means an open expanse. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in other words, the condition that heaven was created in was open. Now, he did not just put one firmament, and I'm telling you why. He, not, he did not put one. Even though there's three heavens, there's two firmaments. Right. So here it is. He made heaven above us. Yes. That's the yes. atmosphere above the earth. That's right. Mm -hmm. The second heaven that's going into the universe. Yes. And then the third heaven, the realm in which the throne of God exists. Yes. Yes. I wouldn't get into how his throne travels on cherubs. It's a portable throne. Come on. And you know, we can so we can worship God in such a realm that his throne can travel from the third heaven into an atmosphere. Yeah. You don't always have to go up. He wants to come down. Yeah. I don't believe it. Watch this. God inhabits. How does he get out of His throne travels into the sound of praise. And where his throne is, his authority is. See, sometimes you don't have the authority to make the decree until there's an atmosphere. Now watch this. Watch this. So you want to move in governmental authority? Become a praiser. You don't believe it. See, y'all thought that, see, See, the part of us that doesn't want to be religious thinks that that's just catchy. Come on. Become a praiser. Come on, sir. Come on. You cannot. Why do you think David 
moved in so much governmental authority. Because he was the type of man that danced out of his clothes. Now, so watch this. Watch this. So, so you have the heaven above us. In between that heaven, above it, is a firmament. Right? Then, in between that and the third heaven is another firmament. And when God first made it, it was made in the condition that both of them were open. Now the reason why is because when you read the book of Revelation, whenever a decree is made, do you see the immediate effect is seen and felt on the earth. So in other words, everything that happens first begins in that realm. Yes. I'll prove it to you. In scripture, we know that Adam fell, correct? Yes. correct? And we also know that Jesus went to the cross for us. Yes. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Right? right? Yes. Into glory. Yes. But what we don't pay attention to is how the Bible says before the foundation of the world. Someone say before the foundation of the world. This, this means when there was only a supernatural realm. This, so this is before there was a natural realm. So we hear that word before the foundation of the world. It's saying before there was a natural realm. When there was only a realm of the supernatural. This is what the Bible is saying. It's saying it's that before the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, it had to happen there first so that it could be legal to happen in the natural. Nothing that you do outside of that realm can come in legally. Is the reason why you can't afford not to be spiritual. Oh God. You can't afford to be carnal. You can't afford, come on, to be a lukewarm Christian because there are things that you're praying to happen that they cannot happen until you enter the supernatural realm. This is why God said, Moses, I'm not going to let you enter into the promised land. And Moses said, Give them a man that will go in and that will come. You have to learn how to go in and go out. Don't talk about shot time. I feel this thing. Come on, you have to learn how to go in and how to come out. You have to learn how to go in, how to enter and adjust things, how to go in the spirit realm and begin to reverse things in the spirit and bring them into alignment with the plan of God. the natural to be responsive to the supernatural to receive from the supernatural and this is why the first firmament and the second firmament this is why there's not a third there doesn't need to be because here it is you got third heaven firmament it's open second heaven firmament then the earth why is that? Because everything that God does begins in his realm. Oh God. And we have a responsibility. I want to tell you what it is. He gave you the earth. He gave you dominion. And so what does so because he gave you dominion on the earth? You're saying, God, will you please do this? He's like, I did it. I, I did it already. I declared it. I decreed it. I finished it. Everything I want to do is done. I already made your miracle. I already made your breakthrough. I already brought you into your promotion. I already did it in the spirit. But now I need you to walk in a faith that will materialize it in the natural. And in order to do that, I have to teach you how to bring the heavenly atmosphere into this realm so that things can pass from the third heaven into the second heaven and from the second heaven into the first.
Jesus, amen. And watch this. So in other words, when heaven is not open, there can be no answer prayer. Now watch this. Because I want you all to see it. Now some people will say, well, heaven is already open. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some scripture. I remember the book of Revelation. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Here behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Right? Revelation 1.10. Correct? Mm -hmm. So here it is. He hears the voice of God. He looks. He sees Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then Revelation 4. There was a door standing open in heaven. Now wait a minute. I thought he was already in heaven. So I'm in heaven looking at Jesus and there's a door in heaven that opens. When I'm in heaven already. So he's in heaven but he goes into a heaven of the heaven. <laughs> goes into a heaven of the heaven. Then he says, there's days I'm, I, I must show you that will shortly come to pass. Then when we get into, I think it's Revelation 19, he sees heaven open again. And a horse comes out mm -hmm. of the heaven when he's in heaven. Yes, sir. So he's in heaven, sees Jesus, a door opens in heaven, he goes up, and then a heaven above that heaven that he just went into opens again. What am I trying to communicate to you? Come on, God. What am I trying to communicate to you? Tell us that. Someone say, enter in, enter in. to his gates yeah. with thanksgiving. Yeah. Now watch this. So I enter into his gates. Someone say, there's gates. Yeah. They open by thanksgiving. Now we're getting somewhere. My God. That's not just like a church scripture. That's not like an altar call, like opening service scripture. Okay, that scripture is a divine blueprint of how to enter the supernatural realm. So enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Then it says, enter into his what? Courts. With praise. So, so in other words, this, this was revealed to us. Your heart attitude determines if you get past the doorkeeper of the gate. You see, you want to hold your anger towards another person and you're hindering your own breakthrough. You're hindering yourself. You want to be prideful. Uh -huh. Deal with that pride. Because the preacher isn't going to tell me what to do. My and now we done left you. And we're somewhere else in the supernatural. And you're sitting in the seat with an attitude. I didn't feel anything at service today. It's because you did not enter. What's this? So, enter into the gates. Thanksgiving. So, so, you have to understand. I don't care what anybody teaches you. Never forget this. There is a way to enter the supernatural. Yes, there is. If it wasn't true, everyone would know how to do it. Right. Right? Teach today and now here. Listen. In the spirit realm, almost nothing is more important mm -hmm. than the condition of your heart. The Bible says that God weighs the spirits of man. He weighs the spirit of man. 
he measures the spirit of man. So in other words, he looks into your heart and determines where he can actually take you. So in other words, this is why it's not a method. Oh God. We can create a method and we'll never get there. It's not just screaming loud. It's not just being quiet. You can sit quietly and go nowhere. It's not being quiet or being loud. Well, I pray quiet. Well, I pray loud. But if your heart's not right, you're both wrong. How do you approach? How do you approach? What's your heart posture when you approach God? Are you thankful? Yes. Now watch this. So enter in to the gates Thanksgiving. Then it reveals to us that it's an ongoing praise that takes us deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then before you know it, there's a worship comes on you. And then before you know it, you're lost in the worship. And then before you know it, you lost track of time. And then before you know it, all of a sudden, you're overwhelmed. You're weeping. You're crying. You're praying for nations. Now all of a sudden, you're interceding for girls that have been sex trafficked. Now all of a sudden, see that's how you enter into intercession. You don't come with your own agenda. You let the anointing come on you as you enter the courts. Decide though. But but here's my point. Here's my point. They have too many Christians that live outside of the supernatural and then wonder why their life doesn't change. Religious, carnal, self focused. Prayerless, passionless, no zeal, don't care about the millions of people that die every day and go to hell, not moved by your family not knowing Jesus, not moved, you go to work every day. You're around all these unsaved people and, and, and you not one time have you felt a burden? All you're worried about is I don't want you to cuss by me. That's, that's your Christianity. So they stop cussing around you but they don't get free and come in quiet. They're still going to hell. It doesn't matter what they do around you. You should have so much of the fear of God on you yes. that when people get around you, they stop without you telling them. That's right. They just come in. I don't know what it is about this person. I have people where I get around, they're still like scared of me. And I don't know why. But then the Lord told me. He said it's because. Sometimes, see, when there's, when there's sin, in our lives, yeah. sin creates, watch this, number one, shame and condemnation. Yeah. Yeah. And it was shame and condemnation that made Adam run from the voice yeah. of God. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes when people get around you, they'll feel a conviction for their sin. Yeah. It's true. But they're not doing it just because of you. That's right. Right. They're doing that because they're experiencing the presence of God through you. Right. Yeah. 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 And you have the opportunity to break the condemnation off of them. Yeah. Reveal the love of the Father to them. And bring them into the kingdom of God. But we miss, we, I feel this so strong. We miss opportunities. Because we're selfish. 
Now, now watch this. I want to stop here. So he withheld the dew. I gave you all that teaching on the open heavens to say this to you. One of the ways to open heaven is to move in divine purpose. There's going to be things that will open over your business as you obey God. There will be things that will open. Some things do not work because you are not connected to God. You're not doing what God told you to do. I want to tell you a secret. We go, oh, well, I don't have time to go to church because I'm in my business. I'm going to teach you a secret. You will get more done in the supernatural. Than you. Get. Let me say it this way. If you clear all your time and remove God out, you can work 70 to 80 hours in a week. And then I can be over here and have my focus on the Lord yeah. while doing my business. And I can work 40 hours and get three times more done. Because here there's favor, here there's blessing, here God is sending angels to go talk to people to connect to me. Here God is divinely drawing clients to me. Here people are reaching out, blessings are chasing me down. Come on in over here, I got to work, I have to toil, I have to sweat. Come out of that curse, Adam. Come out of the toiling of the field. You've been brought back into the blessing. Never believe the deception that in order to get more done, you need to remove God from it. How about this? I don't know why I'm on that. Now look at this. So he said that, therefore, so we're verse 10, therefore the heavens above you withhold dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. Because of withholding. God wants to release everything he has. He wants to release all his plans to you. Yeah. But he needs us to become people of purpose again. Yeah. People of his purpose. Yeah. Watch this. Watch this. For I called a dracul. Yeah. Mm. We've been rebuking the devil. <laughs> we think we're in a spiritual warfare. Now listen, I love y'all know I love some spiritual warfare. I know you do. <laughs> but I don't want to be in it all the time. And I want some, some intimacy with God. I want to worship. I want to lift my hands and love on him. I want to know him. I don't want to know demons better than I know God. Come on. I don't want to know hell more than I know heaven. And I don't want to know about Satan's devices more than I have knowledge of the glory. I don't want to be well versed in demonology and not know anything about angels. I feel this. Now, now look at this. So he said, I called a drop. It's not spiritual warfare you're in. That's right. Now, some of you may be in some. <laughs> you know. So I'm not saying you're not in any. <laughs> you know. Some of y'all have some crazy dreams and attacks and witches coming to you, all type of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. However, there's sometimes. Where God is just trying to get our attention. Yes. Now listen. He said, For I called a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain, and the new wine and the oil. I caused a drought. I stopped sending my healing power to the same degree. I stopped pouring out revival. Do you want to know why there's a, a pause in revival? Mm -hmm. Do you want to know why there's 10 years between each revival? Mm -hmm. Do you want to know why some revivals are 50 years apart? Do you really want to know why? Yeah. Revival is the normal condition. Yeah. In other words, it's not a special time. Oh, God. We're so used to being dead 
that we think being alive is special. How about this? What do you think about this? So here it is. You have a person who's dead. In the tombstone, you have a person who's alive. Right? We don't look, so if I'm dead, I'm like, wow, that person's alive. That's never going to happen to me. That's the church. That's what we do in revival. We fail to realize that this is how I was always meant to be all the time. So when we're talking about Pentecost, Pentecost is a three-day feast. So it was intended, I don't have time to go into the theology. It was intended to be a feast that continues mm -hmm. until the return of Jesus. Yes. So in other words, what began in the book of Acts was intended to continue all the way through yes. until Jesus returns. Yes. I want you to read the book of Acts. That's supposed to be your life. Yes. That's supposed Hallelujah. to be my life. Yes. Now, with that said, here has given us insight into why God withholds the new wine and the oil, not to take it from us, but to get our attention. Yeah. Now look at this. On whatever the ground brings forth, and on men, and on livestock, and on all the labor of your hands, your career, your business, your work, I'm trying to get your attention. Come on. Now look. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. I, I, I really don't want to go into this, but you need to learn how to recognize the voice of someone who's sent by God. Uh, and I'm going to say that for me, I'm saying any sent person. That's right. Look what it says. Look what it says here. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. The people feared the presence of the Lord. Here it is once again. You can't get away from the fear of God. We're right back to the fear of God. I don't have time to teach on it. But look at this. Verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. All this to get here. He stirred up the spirit. Jesus. Look at this. Of Zerubbabel, yes. the son of Shetel, yeah. governor of Judah, yeah. and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat. The high priest, watch this, and the spirit of the remnant people. Mm. He stirred their spirit. Yeah. He stirred their spirit. But look what it says. Look, look, look at the sign of a remnant person. I gave you one earlier. Number one, they moved by what moves God. Yeah. Number two, they are people who are stirred for a crisis. You're not a remnant person because you don't like traditional church. I feel that thing. That hits y'all. You are not a remnant person just because you do not like traditional church. You're just a religious believer who has repositioned yourself around the fire but won't come into it. I don't want to get around it. I want to get into it. Now, look at this. So it says he stirred the remnant of the people and they came and worked on the house of the Lord. So in other words, a sign that you're a remnant person, the sign that you are truly stirred is that you are stirred to do heaven's agenda. You are stirred to do heaven's agenda. I feel this. And watch this. And you're not stirred even when you do it and you're filled with complaining. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 
Dele ne me kupa. I feel this thing. Mm. There's so much I can say here. Why would I be complaining? Mm. If I'm going and I'm seeing people saying, why would I complain? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Why? The other day, my wife and I, we were, we were on a date. We went to a really nice restaurant. Oh, she, she looks so pretty. Yeah. 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 She looks pretty today. Yeah. My lady. So, so, you know, we went out to eat, and then we went out to eat, we're having a good time, and we've been to this restaurant um, three different times. Um, it's in Ponte Vitra, um, and so we go out there having a good time, and each time we've gone, we, we uh, have the same serve. Now, the first time we went, it was funny, I, I forgot my wallet. We, we live, like, 50 minutes away. So... We call Donald. <laughs> I'm like, Donald, we need you to go to the house, knock on the door. We'll call Jasmine ahead of time because my kids will not answer the door. They won't. Like, you'll be right out there. They'll be like, you can hear him in the door. Is that Uncle Donald? I think that's Uncle Donald. They will not answer the door. So, good training, good training. So, so listen. So, so we had to call the kids ahead of time. Yeah. So we had to reach out, like, hey, y'all, someone's going to be at the door. It's going to be Uncle Dom. Make sure it's him. We have a cold word, everything. I mean, yeah. everything. So anyway, you know, so um, he gets it. He drives the wallet 50 minutes up to us. And so that developed a connection with the server. Mm -hmm. Because we're joking with him, like, man, I forgot my wallet. He was like, I thought you guys were going to run out of here. You know, he's joking with us. So, so I was like, I thought about it. I thought about it. I thought about what I'm saying. Jesus saved me. You know, we could have we did it smooth. Like, for the baby just go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, so we end up waiting. We get there. We build a connection with them. We go another time. And at that time, I didn't forget my wallet. So it was a, it was a good experience. So this time when we go back, um, we're, we're there. And my wife and I were sitting. And we're like, Something, something's not right with the server. Something's not right. He's still talking, he's still, but something isn't right. Yeah. So my wife, when he walks away, she looks at me and she's like, I feel like maybe, maybe he's suffering some type of loss. Mm -hmm. There's something going on. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, he gets back, my wife looks at him and she goes, is there something wrong? Mm -hmm. He goes, and, and then he goes, I'll be right back, I gotta, I gotta go do something. Uh -huh. So he leaves, comes back uh, after a while, and when he gets back, um, my wife asked him again. He says, you know, I want to be honest when you ask me. He said, I've been drinking. Wow. It's like because um, I lost my, my dog. Wow. I know it sounds silly, but when you, you, do I have some pet owners in here? Yeah. Right? I'm not a pet owner, but I'm saying they become part of the family. Right? Now, now think of this. It was also having a child. And it was, a, it was not a baby they planned. Mm. And so financially, there was some things going on. Oh. And we sat and we, we prayed for him. Yeah. Right there. And, and here it is. I mean, the presence of God, yeah. the comforter, yeah. came in that place so strong. Yeah. One of the other waiters was walking past and she felt the power of God. Yeah. It, was, it was tremendous. And he told us, I'm so thankful they all came tonight. It was emotional. It was, but the thing I think, we're on a date. I could have been like, not right now, babe. No. We've been ministering all week. We've, we've been praying for people all week. No, this is all the time. You're over there looking all pretty and cute. No. We're, me and you. Right? But, but, but you have to you have to lay down your life. You have to lay down your life. And so God wants to stir us so that we're able to, to reach a people. I want to give you a couple more signs um, that I am a true remnant person. I told you the, the spirit is stirred. Now, the stirring of your spirit 
What this means, if, to put it in words that I use, is that your spirit is active. That's all it means. Yes. That your spirit is active. Mm -hmm. So what this means, a person with an active spirit, it means, number one, that they live spirit first. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. So a person with a stirred spirit, what it means is that the primary part of you is functioning in its proper divine order. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, when, when the fall happened, we began to live the opposite of what God intended the entire time. And, I, and I, I'll use, it, use an example. So we are spirit, soul, body. Now in, in scripture, every time it talks about our humanity, it talks about us from that law first mention that the spirit comes first. The reason why is because that is the real you. So if you left your body today, you would be operating in your true self. Your spirit, the primary part of you. Your body is like a container. It's like a high level of technology that holds your spirit. Right? Now listen. So your spirit is first. Now, I want to tell you all a mystery. Now, tell me, if you're getting tired, I can stop. You're getting tired? Oh, I want to tell you a mystery real quick. Why is fasting powerful? Because if you understand what I'm about to say, you're going to understand more deeply what I'm teaching you about spirit first. Okay? So I'm going to use fasting so it's going to have a dualistic nature. You're going to know why you fast. And then you're going to realize why you've been fasting and it has not been effective. Okay? So, fasting is not powerful because you're not eating. I can prove it to you. There are people that fast more than me. More than my wife. And don't experience half of what we experience. There are religious people who fast and they don't even know God. Right. It's true. People that follow Islam fast. Right. It's not just not eating. Okay? So what makes fasting powerful? It comes back to its original purpose. It's to shut out the things of the world so that your spirit can be back in the driver's seat. So in other words, the part of you that was made to be interactive with God yes. becomes the most active part of you. Yes. Oh, God. Wow, wow, wow. Good. Now, I'm going to show you that you've been living backwards. If I say, for the next hour, we're going to pray in tongues. You know what would happen? Something in you would want to go back to speaking from your mental language within the first three minutes. Do you know why that happens? Because you are used to living natural first. Oh man. So it's uncomfortable to not know what you're saying. Because you're used to living from this version of speech first. You're not used to your heavenly speech being your dominant language. You see this yet? Yes. So for us, the supernatural is just an experience. So in other words, the supernatural is I come to church and I have an encounter. I come to church, someone lays hands on me and I fall. I feel a presence while I see. That's our, that's our spiritual. Mm -hmm. Not a lifestyle of living in the spirit. Yes. So in other words, this is what I want you to know. Your spirit doesn't turn off. Yes. So in other words, it's not like you're going um, out these doors and you go, okay, let me shut off my spirit now. Okay. What's happening is your awareness. Now, watch this. I want, to, I want to prove it. Think about in scripture when Peter walked on the water. You remember how he walked out on the water? Yeah. Then he started focusing on the wind. Right. And then you know what happened? He came back into the natural. 
And when he came back under the natural, what's this? He came under natural law again. When he was focused on the supernatural, he was operating above natural law. So this is what I'm trying to get you to see. Because you give all your focus to the things of this world, you live under limitation. So when you learn how to make the kingdom first, your focus. What happens is, as you make the kingdom first, you start to come out of the limitations of the natural. I'll use one. The limitation of time. Did you know that time is not supposed to work against you? Oh, I feel this. Time is supposed to serve you. This is why there were people in scripture that commanded the adjustment of time. Yeah. Hmm. Let me give you an example. So a family here, they, they, they needed a release of money. Mm-hmm. They were told the release was not going to happen until a certain amount of time. But they needed it. Right. Like that day. So they came to me. And they said, we need this release of money. I don't know what we're going to do. I said, I'm going to command time to serve you. And what's this? So, so I laid my hands on them. And I started praying for them. And I commanded that time would speed up the process for them. I spoke to time. Now, when this happened, it was 11, 30, 11, 40 or so. We waited around. Y'all know how we're here, Lee. We waited around. We were talking. We get in the car. My phone rings. It's them. I pick it up. It's 12.51. And the deposit of the money went into their account. Before they got home. It wasn't supposed to come yet. And the deposit showed up on their bank at a time that banks don't even do deposits. Some of you are behind time. And God will use your voice. Come on, to bring the acceleration. Some of you will do more this year than you've done in the last five years because you've learned how to commit the time to serve you. You've learned how to walk in and operate above time itself. There's going to be people that will tell you it's supposed to it'll take your business like 10 years to get to this point. It's not going to take mine 10 years. They're getting tired. See, there's a mixed multitude in here. Now, now watch this. Watch this. I want y'all to see it. So his focus determined the realm he operates in. Now you know why the devil's always trying to steal your focus. Always trying to bring you out of the supernatural. Always trying to keep you out of prayer. If I have an encouragement for you, it is this. There's not a single thing you could do on earth that's more important Mm -hmm. than your prayer life. Nothing. Nothing you do on earth. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask me for anything. 
You can command time. Come on. You can ask me for anything. This is what I'm saying. Nothing is impossible to a person that abides in the presence of God. is stirred, they operate in the supernatural. They operate and live within the supernatural. Not momentarily. This is my dwelling place. I dwell here. I live here. I walk here. I walk in my divine citizenship. I am not a person that's going to heaven. I'm seated there. Now, I got one more encouragement for you. Now, now we know remnant people. There are people that pray. There are people that carry the burden of the Lord for their region, for their city, for transformation. Right? We're people that are stirred to do the work of God. We work. Really, people work. Yes. We serve. Yes. And we do it unto the Lord. Yes. And here's my last encouragement for you. Yes. So yes, we're praying people. Yeah. But this is my last encouragement yes. for you. When your spirit is stirred. Yes. When your spirit is stirred. You are prepared. For the move of God that's coming. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm going to teach you a secret. Y'all want to know this secret? I want to use an example. Come on. Let's say I picked five people. Uh-huh. And I pick five. But let's say I pick these people strategically. Yeah. I pick one person who is sleeping during church. Yeah. I pick another person who is skeptical. Mm -hmm. So they're awake, they're listening, but they're skeptical. Mm -hmm. I pick another person who, they're not skeptical, they just have no passion. Mm -hmm. Then I pick a person who is interested. Mm -hmm. They like what we're doing, but, you know, if it, if, uh, whatever happens just happens. Right. And then I pick this last person. And this person is a person that says, I'll pay any price yes. to see the move of God. Right. Yes. Yes. Any price. And let's say I'm standing here. And the Lord says, I want you to breathe on them. There will be a difference in the reception level. Yes. Yes. Now listen, the Lord taught me something about the law of receiving. Yes, sir. The law of receiving is the same for everything. One day, this is what the Lord taught me. I was praying for people at the altar, and he said, teach them how to receive. Jesus. And I said, why? He said, it's not about them falling out. Yeah. Come on. He said, because if they struggle to get the laying on of hands, uh -huh. they'll struggle to get into prayer. Right. Because the law of receiving is the same. We receive with this revelation. Very simple. When I pray, believe that you received it. Not I'm going to. I received it. So in other words, you have to snatch stuff in the spirit. Did you know one of the words? What's this? It's funny. One of the words for power is the word hand. So in other words, he, he puts power even in your mouth. And watch this. Power in your mouth operates like a hand. You can retrieve things that you, I'm, I'm telling y'all. What do you think amen means? 
I'm say, now who knows the definition of amen? So be it. So in other words, a man is a prophetic decree. God is about to pour prophetic oil back on your amen. Your amen is not going to be religious anymore. If you say amen, you're going to be retrieving and snatching stuff. You're going to be making, you're going to establish what's being decreed in the atmosphere. When you say amen, your amen is going to once again be prophetic. to receive the move of God. So, so, so remember the mountain of transfiguration? Y'all remember the figuration? Transfiguration? So Jesus shining in the glory. Moses, everyone's beside him. But here's the crazy part. It says, and when they awoke, they saw the glory. You know what this means? The glory of God can be all around you. Moving all around you. And you not even be at the table. It'll feel like there's no glory in the room when you're not awake. Because when you're awake, your senses are open. When you're awakened, your eyes are open. When you're awakened, your ears are open. And so a voice that has been talking the whole time all of a sudden becomes amplified. People who got stirred them before it even came. That's why there's been people that have gone to revivals that we read about and they say God wasn't there. Sat at Azusa and said God wasn't there. Sat, come on, in Brownsville and said God wasn't there. Sat in the Welsh and said God wasn't there. Because there were people. That were not stirred when they came. They came as inspectors. So, what's our prayer today? As we get ready to, as we get ready to close, my prayer today is that God would stir us as real people. You want to be stirred today? Now, real fast. I want you to know, if while I was preaching, you were not stirred, something may be wrong. I said maybe. I left a potential that maybe I'm just looking at this wrong. But if hearing about God changing cities doesn't move you, so I want to pray for you. I'm not going to lay hands today, but, but I want to pray over you that God would begin to stir a passion in you. He would stir a passion in you. That he would stir the remnant of God. Y'all ready to be stirred? Now, now, I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to pray for you. Excuse me, I thought I was being mean. The Bible says, I search for a man who would stir himself I've been searching for a person that will stir yourself up. Now watch this. Why does he need to, why does he look for a person that knows how to stir themselves? Because uh, if you are placed in a dry land and there's no one to stir you, come on, he wants you to become the catalyst of the stirring. He wants you to become the fire starter. He wants you to become the one that initiates the flame in your region. He's looking for a person uh, You can put me in a place where there's no movement. You can put me in a place where there's no breakthrough, no glory, no miracles, no signs, no prophetic. And when I show up, come on, I begin to stir up those gifts. I begin to stir up those anointings. I begin to stir up something in that region. Something begins to happen. Come on, when a person comes that stirred, something supernatural starts to take place because I am the one that stirred myself in my prayer closet. 
so you can't stir people in public if you don't stir yourself in private. Come on, sometimes I have to go in my prayer closet and have to say, Lord, give me more fire. Lord, give me more fire. Lord, give me more glory. Lord, I'm in a dry place, but right now I begin to lift up my voice to you. I begin to lay hands on my own gifts and I begin to say gifts. Be stirred. Virtue. Be stirred. Power in me. Be stirred. Everything in my belly. I command you to be stirred. I stir it up now. I stir it up now. I stir up miracles. I stir up the gifts of healing. I stir up. Come on. Some of you said I haven't moved in the prophetic in a long time. But you need to learn how to stir yourself up. Come on. You need to learn how to stir up that prophetic gift. Come on. Stir up that realm of the prophetic in your belly. Stir up that prophetic anointing. Stir it up in prayer. Come on. Stir yourself up. A people that don't need the laying on of hands all the time. A people that don't need a prophetic word from someone else all the time. I stir up my own gift in my day that I'll begin to prophesy over myself. Come on. I'll look over myself and I'll begin to prophesy. Chaz, you shall live and not die. Chaz, you will walk in your purpose. Chaz, you will walk in your destiny. Discouragement come off of his vision right now. He will see the nations. You will shake a generation. You will see that building. Come on. You got to begin to prophesy over yourself. Come on, stir yourself now. 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 Come on, witness. Come on, soul winner. Come on, intercessor. Come on, warrior. Come on. You're a buddy and a merchant prophet. Come on, stir yourself. Evangelist, stir yourself. Come on, let the evangelist be stirred. Come on, let the soul winners be stirred. Come on, you deliverer. You're going to cast out devils. Come on, but stir yourself up. Come on, stir up that gift on the inside of you. Even for people that are watching right now, wherever you are, I command the gifts of God on the inside of you to begin to be stirred. All of our witnesses that are watching right now, every listener, every viewer, I command the fire of activation to come upon you. And I command the gifts that are on the inside of you to be stirred up right now by the anointing. Be stirred in the anointing. Be stirred. Come on, stir yourself. Stir yourself. You should have the same level of faith that you can access God. Come on, as you believe a man that prays for you can access God. Come on, God said, today I come to cut out the middle man. Today I come to cut out the middle man. And I'm bringing you to a place where you know that you have access to me. Come on, a few more minutes, a few more minutes. Come on, you should be feeling Naba stirring in your belly. Come on, you should be feeling it. It should be like fire in your bones. Come on, that's what Jeremiah was saying. Jeremiah was saying, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, but I'm going to stir up myself. The anointing in me is still stirred. I don't even want to prophesy, but the anointing in me is still stirred. I don't even want to do this anymore. Come on, out of your belly. Come on, from your belly. From your belly. That's where the power is seated. That's where the power is seated in your belly. Right now, may the hand of God touch your belly. May the hand of God touch your belly. And activate every gift. 
So Father, I bless your people and I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would stir your remnant. Stir them to move in their destiny. Stir, stir them to move in their purpose. I pray that every virtue that God has called you to carry, that the enemy has stolen from you, I pray that that virtue will be restored to you now in the name of Jesus. All virtue that has been buried in the ground, I command it to be exhumed. And I command it to be returned to you now in the name of Jesus. All virtue taken from by demons. All virtue that was stolen by sexual demons. All virtue that was stolen by water spirits. All virtues that were stolen even by people. I command right now in the name of Jesus that virtue to be restored to you right now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, come on, let's give the Lord a hand. We're going to stop here.